Our earth is green, our earth is blue. Protect its goodness for me. Just talking a little bit about your company, which is based in the UK, which is why you're joining us from there. And I believe it's been around since 2010, right? That's right, yes. Founded in 2010. We, we also have a US, uh, US and UK now, really, but we started off in the UK in 2010. And um, that was really the whole idea of the company was to focus on children's nonfiction. Because a lot of children are encouraged to read fiction when they go to school, when they learn how to read. Um, and uh, actually, a lot of young people are more interested in the real world than the made up world. Right. Actually, it's more fascinating than anything you can make up. That was how it was for me when I was young. Mm -hmm. And um, and I feel that's been a little bit underrepresented. And also these days when we're trying to encourage children to understand what is true and what isn't true, how to tell fake news from real news. Right. Nonfiction is really at the vanguard of that because it's mm -hmm. all about understanding how do we know it's nonfiction? You know, how can we prove that it's true? What evidence have we got? And these critical thinking skills are probably more important now than they've ever been in the history of the world. That is such a great point because it, it did really strike me that um, you don't really see a lot of imprints that just focus on nonfiction. And it's also interesting because you do make the point um, on the website when you're talking about the book, uh, I mean, excuse me, about the company that you really work to provide diverse perspectives, which is kind of interesting because I don't know that a lot of us think about that as much with nonfiction as we do with fiction. Let's say like when you're thinking of science, people yeah. or history, maybe a little more with history, but definitely with um, some of the other subjects, you don't think about it as much as I think we talk about it a lot more with um, children's fiction. About yeah. Reality. It's interesting. But yeah. And that's why we called it What on Earth Publishing, because we wanted to yeah. try and capture the spirit of of surprise of looking at things from a different angle what on earth is that you know looking at things from the perspective of how an animal sees the world or an ant sees yeah. the world or zooming out and seeing the the world as a, as a as just a rock sort of floating in space with all the ecosystems and all nature just represented in this fragile ecosystem that's another perspective and it's a really good point about uh, seeing different perspectives in nonfiction because that is the root of how to encourage empathy in young people, I think, right. is for them to understand that they they have one perspective, perhaps, mm -hmm. which which could be even a prejudice or a bias, which we're not mm -hmm. conscious of. But by looking at the mountain from a different perspective or looking at things from the top or the, or the bottom or, or an oblique angle, you suddenly appreciate that um, those different perspectives are equally as valid as your own. And then you can connect with them and you can appreciate people from different cultures and different backgrounds and different, different opinions. And of course, that's the foundation of civilization. If we're to have a civilization, that's where it's got to be rooted, really, in empathy. And is that uh, because I was, I was also struck by your background. You started, I mean, I think you studied history and then yeah. you're a news reporter. You were a tech correspondent. You worked on, I believe, with the educational software so how did you go from all of that, those, that very background, how did you get interested in publishing children's books? Well, that's a great question. I've, I've always, funny enough, when I look back, had a very cross-curricular experience in my life. Right. And, and ever since I was in, um, a junior reporter at the Sunday Times in London, and I was in the newsroom, I remember, and I was just a general reporter, and I was the first person in the newsroom to have a laptop. And nobody had ever seen a laptop. It was a little Toshiba thing. This was way before Windows, right? But it, it had a spreadsheet and a database and a word processor. And the editor came down the aisle and he, and he said, what's that? He didn't know my name, but he said, what's that? I said, it's a laptop. And I showed him what a spreadsheet was. And I showed him how what, you know word processor worked and how you could count the words. And, and he said, that's amazing. You can be the technology correspondent. So I went from history <laughs> university to the technology correspondent of the Sunday Times, just on a little sort of spin of a coin, really. Um, just and and actually, as I look back, ever since then, I've I've been trying to rebel in my own way against trying to put knowledge into silos. I find it really frustrating when I visit schools, and still to this day, we're in that old Victorian mindset of thinking that the world is is divided into different subjects. And I right. say to kids, you know, that's fiction. That's not nonfiction, that's fiction. You don't go down the street and see a bit of maths or a bit of science or a bit of geography, a bit of history. That's not the way the world's organized. If you ask a brain surgeon, how does my brain work? You don't have a bit of math here, a bit of geography and a bit of history and science and art down on the bottom right. That's mm -hmm. crazy, right? We've created a fiction 
that we've said is the way that knowledge operates and it's just wrong. It's fake news. Mm -hmm. The way that things work is that your brain loves to make connections. And when it makes a new connection, you learn something. And often you get a little shot of joy in the form of dopamine. It's a little chemical, you know, in the brain, the reward system, because the brain knows that it can thrive in an environment and adapt if it learns. So you learn to, and this is how humor is based. You know, I've just launched this new magazine. I've got to share it with you. It's called Britannica Magazine. I don't know if you can see it. It's a monthly magazine for kids, all nonfiction. Uh, the real world, far more amazing than anything you make up. It's all nonfiction except for the inside back page, which is the jokes page. Uh, and the reason I have a jokes page is because it proves the point that our brains love making connections. So if I say to you, um, I don't know if this works in, 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 in US speak, but um, what do you call a teacher who's always late for school? Do you know that one? No. Mr. Bus. Do you get it? <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, so this is the idea. So you, a little bit of a laugh, there's a little bit of dopamine, a connection, Mr. Bus, you missed a bus, you know, that we had, right. and you see how brains enjoy learning by making connections. So why right. do we chop knowledge up to different subjects? Why do right. we create this fiction when it's all of it? So everything I do in my nonfiction children's books uh, mm -hmm. business is about trying to see things in different perspectives and make connections between things mm -hmm. to reflect the reality of knowledge and experience. And um, I can't think of anything more important than that. And, and, and I can't think of a more important audience than young people. Uh, the right. first two books I wrote were for adults, uh, published by Bloomsbury. And then I found myself doing lots of lectures in schools. And to answer your question, I had this doorstop of a book from the beginning of time to the present day, the whole history of the world in a single book. It was called What on Earth Happened? And because I wanted to connect knowledge together into a single narrative. But it was too, um, they wanted it for adults. It's not something a 10 year old's going to read. So I then set up this company to create a way for a young person to see the interconnectedness of knowledge by doing these timelines, big visual timelines on the history of the world or nature or science or Shakespeare or, or, or um, uh, 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 British history or, or a sport. And um, I found myself you know, going down a path that had really not been done for many, many years. Timelines are an old fashioned way of storytelling. Uh, and I, but what they do is they allow you to roam freely around the narrative without losing your way, but you're not being told you start at the beginning and start at the end, and you can make connections. Right. Um, and, and they open up conversations because you spot things, other people spot other things, and then you, then you exchange and you have a conversation. I never knew that, I never knew that, the, that Henry VIII was on the, the throne at the same time as Martin Luther was protesting against the Pope at the right. same time that Copernicus had discovered the earth goes around the sun, the same time that the, 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 the Incas were still living in Machu Picchu. How crazy is that? But then you mm -hmm. see it all line up on a, it all connects. So a long-winded answer, but the idea is that it's about trying to create this interconnected world of fascination for young people. Yeah, and, and you really see that in the collection of books that I saw that they, are, they do try to be very interdisciplinary and you, know, yeah. you have a lot of kind of general fact books, but how, like you said, helping kids make those kind of connections is very exciting. Yeah, and, oh, it is. It's it's about it's creating this joy of learning. That's a very it's natural right. curiosity. That's the way you know. The good the good news is we're all born with curiosity. The bad news is that the, the system we have inherited it tends to beat it out of children and and drill and kill yeah. and all those things that lead to uh, a, a brain disease. It happened to our daughter actually when she was eight. She got this brain disease when she was at school, um, and we had to we end up home educating because we couldn't find another school. And I do believe it's a brain disease. It's called boredom. And, I, and I, I'm, a lot of people have had, had this disease yeah. uh, and it's the brain switching off um, because the brain is designed to be stimulated by all the senses. But if it's not stimulated, it starts to close down. And that's early onset depression, which is fortunately is diagnosed as a mental disease. But boredom is like the amber light it's the warning light. And mm. um, so you should never condone boredom. You, that's not the same thing as not giving a child anything specific to do, because that right. allows the imagination to flourish. Um, right. uh, and you're not bored when you're full of fantasies and imagination and, you, and you're not, the world around you is, is sort of evolving in unexpected ways. But, but the idea of being somewhere where you don't want to be because there's nothing to, that interests you is right. a real problem. Yeah. And that's more stifling the imagination than, than encouraging I th it. I think so. I think it's, it, it creates uh, perverse behaviors. You know, it's like it's also crazy to stick 30 people of the same age all in one room together you know, mm -hmm. and sit them down at the desk. I mean, that, how, how, how backwards an idea, who thought of that as a yeah, way of stimulating I mean, young people into loving learning? Right. I mean, 
it's just not rocket science, is it, Liana? But here we are talking about it as if it's something extraordinary and revolutionary. But there we go. Well, as a homeschooler, I definitely support that. I, I can relate to that idea. Great. And that's one of the main reasons okay. that, that we're doing um, But I do want to make sure, because I, I, I'm just looking at the time, that we have time to talk about your sure. the latest book, which is... Um, it just came out recently, I think in February. And this is a, yes, it's up to us, which is there it so is. for anybody watching, it's if you haven't to... had a look at it, be sure to go to the website because they have some of the spreads up that you can look and just see how beautiful the illustrations are. It really is so lovely. And what makes it so interesting is that you did this with um, 33 award-winning artists from around the world. So can you tell us a little bit about the book and then about how the co that collaboration came about? Sure. So this is a book about climate change, which is the most important topic for the foreseeable future. Um, and it's about trying to activate young people to have a conversation with the adults in their lives about mm -hmm. putting nature first. Mm -hmm. And it's very, you know, children um, naturally, uh, excuse the pun, do put nature first. They, they feel themselves a part of nature. They like to go outside. They like playing sport. They want to go for walks in the woods. They like swimming. They like feeling the wind on their face, the, 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 the water in their, up their nose, whatever. When we get to become adults, we often forget nature and we find that we are apart from nature because we're in our cars and in our offices and we're in trains and planes and we somehow feel detached. And what gives me hope for the future is the idea that we can activate young people to remind adults that they're part of nature, not apart from nature. And uh, in January 2021, um, Prince Charles, who's the heir to the throne in um, the UK, he, he's been a passionate crusader for uh, putting nature yeah. first for about 50 years. And right. often people haven't taken him seriously. But mm -hmm. now, as there is the biggest issue by far that we have to face um, and how much we've let future generations down by not addressing it to date. Um, you know, people are beginning to listen. And he launched this new initiative called the Terra Carta, which is in the spirit of a great treaty like Magna Carta. Magna Carta. But, a, but a set of rules that we should have with the planet rather than each other to put nature first. But it was very much aimed at businesses. And when I read about it, I thought, actually, there's an opportunity here to have a bigger impact by doing a children's Terra Carta. Let's tell the story for children, maybe read to them by adults. So that in that very emotional, empathetic environment of the home where you're reading a story to your child, the most important questions of the, in the universe can be addressed together, mm -hmm. breaking the intergenerational sort of boundaries. Uh, because children need to ask their parents, oh, no, why don't we have solar panels? Why, why are right. we eating food that's coming from the other side of the world? You know, what are we going to do about, um, you know, trying to, uh, you know, insulate our homes so we don't use so much energy? You know, all these yeah. things that are practical questions that aren't at the top of people's priorities lists uh, because they're not the habits of the past need to be the conversations of the future. So in this book, we tell the story of nature, how it was before people, what people have done to the environment, how that's damaged the planet, and then what we can do about it, which is called terra carta, these new sets of ideas or principles. And we didn't have very long to do the book because we wanted to get it ready uh, in time for COP26, which was in November. And we're just launching it in the UK tomorrow on Earth Day. Uh, sorry, in the US tomorrow on Earth Day. And, um, and so we didn't have very long and we tried to find an illustrator to do the book and they all said we'd love to do it, but we haven't got time because we only had gave them, you know, six weeks or something. So rather than get one illustrator to do the whole book, we decided we'd get a different illustrator for every spread. So there are 33 artists and it, it turned into the most beautiful project just by mistake because this is the empathy I was describing. Every spread is interpreted through the visual lens of a different culture cultural yes. experience people from china from japan korea from canada aboriginal australia kenya mm -hmm. you know um argentina brazil they're all involved and you can see their different experiences come through the artwork and that speaks to young people in a way that i think words can support but they can't replace mm -hmm. so that's the idea of the book really is to provide a holistic uh, overview of how we've got to where we are, what we can do about it, and to open up this uh, opportunity for conversation between generations. And that's why it's called It's Up To Us. And this is a beautiful cover illustrated by two Vietnamese artists, actually, of the mm. children looking down at nature in all its diversity. Um, and it's called It's Up To Us, Building a Brighter Future for Nature, People and Planet, the Children's Terracotta. And Prince Charles has written a foreword to the book. Uh, and in fact, tomorrow he is um, very kindly, he's um, done a reading of the book 
um, with children. Um, are, so there's his forward on on his note paper there. I don't know if you can see. Um, yes. He's done a reading of the book with children from um, for a selection of children from many cultures around the world, which we're going to release on Earth Day uh, on Friday. Um, and it's a very powerful, moving reading of the book which which will be available on youtube and maybe if if it's possible i can give you a link yana to put uh, uh, up with this so if anybody's interested to take a look they can they can watch it for themselves definitely we will we will share that so everybody can look for that on friday and i just want to say this is so powerful like you said it is such a gorgeous book and having this diversity of perspectives and as a mom i i love the that it takes children so seriously you know that it really oh. sees the Boy. ages change and because I know I've experienced for myself kids are the ones that really hold your feet to the fire and make sure you're doing what you yeah. say you're doing I can yeah. talk to kids about the environment but they really come and he's like well so why aren't we why don't we have solar panels why aren't we doing that why yeah. are we taking the car everywhere you know yeah. I think yeah. like you said, adults I, we I, tend I, to get away from that um really having our actions match our words and yes kids, are very consistent about i mean they really hold you accountable for what yeah. you say and i think again it comes back to this one of the joys of non-fiction is that you don't really patronize to children about non non-fiction you know right. they are fascinated in 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 the world around them whether it's nature or science or space or or amazing things that people have done in history or or, or whatever how things work you know that isn't a patronizing conversation that is a a, a a a conversation full of wonder and joy and fascination and 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 i think by approaching this subject with younger people in this way mm -hmm. that it's i hope likely to have a longer and more powerful impact on adults right. than any number of cop conferences which we know there have been 26 of them what have they produced so right. far you know you do wonder don't you we should have done this book, you know, 26 years ago. And I'd love to know whether, you know, this type of activity could have had a bigger impact. But uh, but we do rely on young people to move the agenda forward. Uh, we want to try and do it in a way that isn't that angry. Um, and that's, of course, a fine line um, because we want to activate young people, but we don't want to enrage them because right. they need to bring the rest of the world with them uh, on this journey. And, and hopefully through the skill of these artists and the opportunity to try and create a, a narrative like this that puts things in perspective from a big point of view, hopefully there's the opportunity to, to make a difference. And I, I was actually just wondering about that point um, as we were talking, how did yeah. you go about, um, I know you're talking about the illustrations help with this or in the text, how did you balance the idea of making sure kids know exactly how um, dire the situation is, but at the same time, have it be a hopeful book that they can really make a difference. And yeah. is it having those practical ideas or how did you try to do well, that? Well, partly it's, it's partly to do with the narrative structure, obviously, and any narrative needs to have structure. Um, and so by starting off by, by explaining how nature works without people and how you get a balanced ecosystem and how everything kind of connects with everything else, then you can look at what people have done to disrupt nature by putting all that extra carbon dioxide in the air, by heating up the planet and what that does to sea levels and what that does to, you know, how it creates. A, I mean, the low point in the book is a spread all about uh, climate refugees, where you can see the water rising and people taking their belongings and their animals and their, and their clothes and they're getting pulled out of the water. And you can see in the distance a tented city where they're having to live. Now, I mean, that it's very visual. It's very graphic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're not in any way trying to deny or dumb down the issues. Um, but then we finish the book with the terracotta messages. And that's really important because it gives us something to be able to. There's this beautiful illustration uh, of a, a, an elephant um, at, with a tightrope tied to a skyscraper. And on this tightrope is a little girl. And on her head is a, is a tree and a big plant pot. And it's a visual metaphor, basically, to say that humanity has nature you know on its head but we're on a tightrope between you know the planet before people and the modern world that we live in and if we trip up nature will collapse uh, mm. but falling off the tree are these little seeds and they're planting themselves in the ground and these are the seeds of hope these are the terracotta concepts or rules of how we will rewild uh, nature how we will restore rainforests how we will label our food so that we know how much carbon was emitted so that we can be proactive and have agency mm -hmm. about how we consume 
how we can use solar panels and how we can use wind energy and enjoy being outdoors. There's a little picture of a solar panels and a wind farm and a little boy outside with his dog playing with a kite. Now he's, he, he's thrilled on his face right. because, and, but he's using wind power, you know, for his entertainment. He's, he's, he's engaging with his dog for empathy. He's outside, nothing could be more, you know, he's not inside using a video game or whatever else. So, mm -hmm. and, and it's just trying to uh, allow those, um, almost creating, uh, scenes of, of wonder and aspiration uh, that young people can then, that will impress upon those young people and then give them something to, to want to strive to recreate in their own lives with the adults that they, they have in their lives. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And the book is, it's up to us and it goes on sale on Earth Day. And also we will share the special video of the Prince of Ch Prince Charles reading the book. Um, yeah. And I do want to make sure that people know talking about, you know, having actions match, match your words that half of all the proceeds from the sales will go to uh, the Prince's Foundation, which is his environmental charity. So you're not only helping teach your children, you're actually helping support work in the real world. So thank you so much to join for joining. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you. You too. And thank you for the opportunity. Earth is green. Our earth is blue. Protect its goodness for me and